So Padma is a practicing architect who currently works with Research Design Office, which is a design collaborative between architects in three cities. She has worked in firms in India and the US on architecture and interior projects ranging from schools, multi-family housing, and private residential projects. She has an undergraduate degree in architecture from Bangalore University and a master's in environment and energy studies in architecture from the Architectural Association London. So you welcome Padma. You have the under the inga. I'm tethered. I, I was considering introducing myself, but I was like, let her get away with the boring stuff. I'll go on to the more fun stuff. Um, can I get a bit of background? Are you all school children here? Uh, grades 9 to 12, between grades 9 to 12. And you're here because you've heard of architecture. You have some relation to architecture. OK, I'm going to give you my, you, yeah? I've been a fifth year in architecture, actually. You're a college girl. <laughs> Well, most welcome. I'm always happy to see. I thought of architecture differently then, then differently 10 years back, differently now. So I want to give you a glimpse of my journey and what I think is a part of architecture that's not given as much attention. Yeah? So uh, she's told you all about me. I've done my undergrad in architecture in India and uh, postgrad abroad. Uh, I've worked in two countries. So I've seen the ethos of how people think in different countries. And I sort of tried to put that together. Yeah. So let's get away with the definition of architecture. What is architecture? You're designing space. It's an art. It's a science. It's a coming together of two types of thinking, creative thinking as well as problem solving. right? But what is space? Any kind of open space, closed space, we are choreographing anything that is choreographed man-made will come under architecture. So what is space? There is a physicality to space, right? There's a certain dimension. This place where this building is has a certain size to it. It has a certain height to it. There are buildings around. There's a sky. So there's a physicality to space. And solving that is mostly architecture. That's what most architects do. But there is also a psychology of space. Space has a certain effect on people. People live in cities, in villages, and they have a completely different approach to life only because of the way they live, the space they live in. It has a psychological effect on people. So for instance, this itself is a whole new career by itself called environmental psychology. How does a space affect the brain? I'm going to give you some examples and ask you if you can relate to it. So they have done studies where they've said, if you're in a large space, it sort of enhances your creativity. You're able to see further. You have a vision. Or if you're in a large space, but within it, you have a completely different relation to space. Right? If you're sitting here in your room and you're watching a large space, you're probably thinking, but when you're within the space, you have to respond to the space. You're traversing the space. You have a completely different reaction to it. Do those words, you think you could relate to some of that? Yeah? That was when you're thinking and felt like you could think of a vision. This is more going inward again. This is a completely different kind of large space. This is also large. Yeah? But it is bringing a sense of belonging because it is somehow herding people towards the space where everybody is within. And it's a completely different kind of feeling here, community belonging. So the same adjective for a space is creating so many different feelings in one. Right? Now what about small? What do you think a small space can do? Any thoughts? I just said a few keywords there, right? Adjectives, community, gratitude, wonder. What about small space? What can a small Calm. space do? Calm? Reflective. Reflective? Personal. Personal, absolutely. 
There's so much within a small space. What about that? Focus, intensity. It depends on how it is also. If it's too clustered and Absolutely. Like happy, it, it makes you very irritated. Absolutely. So you're relating, you're re reacting to the space, right? But also office cubicles are small. Sometimes when you have five things to be done, a small space with a small height is known to make you focus with one intent in your head. One intent in your head is not going to make you creative. So then you have to move from space to space, get you to think, get the blood flowing, do something else, right? What about this? This is a two people space, right? Doesn't it feel like instead of a community, you're going to make a one-on-one -on -one relation? Right? So you're going in, in a hierarchy. You have a different relation to space. And everything will make a difference. Small exercise. Just think. Do you guys have a favorite space? Just think at the top of your head. It could be anything under a tree, some anything you know. We'll just quickly go one by one. Uh, school. Any particular space in the like school? My ground. The school ground. The school ground. Yeah. At that level? My Your classroom? Under waterfalls. Okay. <laughs> My apartment terrace. Ah, why? What is there in the terrace? It's very open. Are you alone there? Are you with friends? <laughs> no, alone. Alone there, okay. Um, the garden area? Any garden area? Yeah, with the benches. With the? With the benches. Okay. So you're interacting there. My dancing with the swing. Ah, alone, contemplating. <laughs> Alone. <laughs> Are you getting a sense of personalities here? What is your favorite space? Balcony. Your balcony. Same house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I must see your balcony. Your architect <laughs> must have done a good job. Kaji. Space where I can read. Any space where you can read. One on one then. Just yourself. Three houses. Three houses? It's connection with nature. Yeah? Your desk. You are a focused individual. <laughs> Yeah. Huh? Any, outdoor Any outdoor space. My car's cockpit. No. <laughs> car? Did you just say car? Oh my god. But that is in motion though, right? You like that motion. But I'm driving. Yeah? But not, but not somebody else is driving, but I'm driving. So you guys have certain spaces as favorite, not because of the size of it or a dimension of it. It has a certain effect on your psychology, right? Anything you react, you react, you react to anything. But can someone tabulate that, put that together, and design it for you? So, an architect uh, from a big firm called Snoheta, he said he uh, went to a party with his friend, where his friend had a farm, and there was a sheep dog there, that you know, shepherds sheep and everything. And in that party. He noticed, subconsciously he noticed, the sheepdog was tapping people on the nose. And he noticed after a sudden while they were all over, suddenly they're all in one little corner. That sheepdog has sort of herded them towards the space. Architects can choreograph that. He said, we have to be that sheepdog. Can we study? And none of the people are even conscious of it. They're not actually actively thinking of it. You know, this is like reality. There's an objective reality and there's a subjective reality. The physicality of space and psychology of space is sort of similar to that. It's a very personal relation, how you relate to it. So, but can architects choreograph that? Can you, as a professional, study this and create it? Now you see, everything is getting so super specialized. Everything can be choreographed, down to the DNA. Why not this? Let's make happy spaces for everybody. You don't have, to, even in the slum, you can do this. So let's study this and go more in depth. So f now we talked about yourself, right? Self and your response to space. And the self has so many ways of responding. I just want to run through some to sort of stimulate your thinking a bit. Your first response to space is the kind of space you're in. This is a macro look at thing. Where do you live? Do you live in a forest kind of space? Do you live in a city kind of space? Obviously, you're in 
the tactile city with like assaulting your senses, horn, sound, smell, sights, and it's different every second and yet the same. Right? That's a different kind of assault. This is a different kind of assault. <coughs> too much of one thing can be bad for everyone. Everyone knows that. Too much sugar, too much carbohydrates. Everybody knows you have to moderate. Right? Feel of light. Not all light. Keep some light away. Keep, let some light in. How can you shape light so that you can react to it? Smells, how can you, a smell can make a relation with the space. I, my grandmother used to live in Bombay, grandparents, and I used to keep going there every year, every summer for holidays, uh, for vacation. And then uh, they moved on and everything. And then 15 years later, I went back to that same Vadala station because I needed to go get my birth certificate. You won't believe it. I stepped out, I didn't recognize anything. I just went back with the smell. There was some sort of factory or something that had always been there and it smelt a certain way. It just threw me back. Never underestimate smell. It's always there with you, just not thought about in the subconscious. Another kind of smell. Do you read Tamil? Man made material when it reacts to nature, or even, of course, sand and water. Manvasane. It's a beautiful smell. Can you create it within your house? How can you create it? I love Manvasana. Can I design my house so that I have this in my house? Yes. Just a small example. Texture. When we walk, they say reflexology and they give you walks outside. Can we create that for ourselves in our houses? This is my partner's bathroom. This is her favorite kind of texture for her feet. She created, that's her bathroom floor. She brought those pebbles inside the house so that every time we have a bath, it's like a massage for the feet. Can texture go beyond and create art, three-dimensional art with texture? So this is a project where we used bricks. And then we're like, why don't we start having fun with that brick? Why not, instead of just a brick wall, we start doing something and this abstract thing started becoming like a tree. So then people come and came and said, like a tree of life. Can you see that? The bricks started coming out and creating a shape. And each one perceives it in a different way. What do you think this could be? Could be many things. One dominant thing, I think. Yeah? So people have waterfalls on purpose designed within your vicinity just for the sound. It's supposed to have a calming effect, right? But the nature of the sound, everything matters, but you do rea react to it. What about this? When you walk through an old temple, something about the feel of how many people have walked there does something to you. When you walk in Rome and you're standing in the Colosseum, you're suddenly like, centuries ago, there were these gladiators here. I am in that same spot. That's a very extreme example. But, <laughs> but aging has a sense of its own. It's a sense of time within you, built within you, where you can, in an instant, relate to an individual from 1 AD. You know? We went to this. Uh, Marayur, where they had structures built by early men in, I think, 400 BC or something. Dolmens. They were just two stone walls and a stone roof, completely unremarkable. What makes it remarkable is when you stand there and you think, first humans were here. They made this with their hands. They touched this very thing that I'm touching. Aging has that character. Can you design for things to age? Yes, you can. You can desi design for a stone with a moss to build over it so that it lasts, but changes with age. People build with copper. Copper looks different with age. And they do it on purpose. It can be choreographed, but observe. Like, don't miss it. There, there are these things around you that, if you observe, can bring so much meaning to your thought. 
we designed uh, this house for this uh, lady and in our house we were renovating it so you just open cupboards and she had all these vessels and everything we were like what happened her mother had just moved from the village and brought all of this and these old vessels they were so beautiful and we put them in spaces in the house as a lamp as a basin as handles creating a sense of nostalgia some relation to that item is there around you can a space stimulate your senses like a waterfall right you said waterfall why do you like it it's awakening your senses right it's doing something so when you climb something so steep your feet will be tingling or when you walk into a space and the light is too bright it's just light but it's also stimulating you stimulating your sense so that was how just going beyond like you know touch and taste and i didn't go even go to taste there's also taste i used to eat plaster from the walls when i was a kid <laughs> don't do that but how we as a person within ourselves how our senses relate to the space around us now let's step outside of the self and see what happens around us we were each selves sitting here till nandini came and said let's get together suddenly we are a community we went out of our alone self and we were acknowledging that we are not just one anymore we're not a single person anymore we are a part of this group so that is environs and the self yourself with other things and that other thing can be other humans animals nature anything right and the relation i will now this is a phd by itself but i'll just talk about what i think is an important way of relating the self and the environs one is a transactional relationship and one is a relation so when you're sitting here it's a transactional you are here you're here for something and you've come here for something and they're going to give you something when you start talking to each other and it's everybody's um interacting right now it's a bit transactional but when you start talking it's more relational and that can be also between two spaces a man made space and a natural space i could have cut all these trees and just had the landscape around that would have been more transactional instead this is a more natural space so we left the trees there and built the amphitheater around the trees because we wanted the trees to have a relationship with that space it is shading that space it is doing something to that space this is another project where um, the ladies office thanks to vasudu had to be in the back corner not in front of the garden and in the back corner was an old mango tree we could have had an office with a window where she saw the tree but the tree had been there forever and we wanted to have a relationship with the tree and that informed us having a glass roof so that the building is a response is in relation to that tree it's in relation with that tree and she sits there and she loves sometimes of course mangoes fall so we had to have a uh, tough and glass roof there but i'm talking about how you can grab more from what is around you and sort of sitting by yourself can you have a relationship with things around you and is it going to be beneficial for you and that was man made a natural space what about self and the community transactional relational classrooms what do you think could be relational everything is a spectrum now classrooms with desks where the way we studied with four people behind a desk where you can't really budge because you're in the middle and there's one here there's two here it's going to be more transactional because there's less chance to be relational a classroom where we are like this you're a little free you can stand up easily and you're free you you feel more freedom to get up and say something right so there's a percentage now some relational more transactional versus so what kind of classroom somebody said classroom right you said classroom you said classroom is your classroom more transactional or relational relational what kind of classroom is yours where do you study 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why is it relational? We just like it's not like we have a specific way to sit and look at something. We just sit wherever we want. So you feel more freedom. more freedom. Nobody's telling you that's your desk. Go sit there. And does that freedom make you feel better? What you like it? You can relate more to more friends. You can also easily approach the teacher. A simple thing like this is changing the dynamic of how you relate to other people, how you relate to your teacher, so simple. If I was behind a desk with four people, I am not going to get up and say, ma'am, I know the answer. I used to be like that, but there were many who were shy and wouldn't. You need to bring them out. I am going to, so this really weird thing, okay. I was going to do this, and then this week, um, I, we collaborated with an architect in the US who is giving a design for a university in Madras, a new university that's coming up. And he presented this, uh, this study that I thought was the way architecture should, you know, it should, that's the way architecture should change people's lives. That's what architecture should do. So they had to go to, they had to do a design for Georgia Tech University. This architecture firm, this person that we are collaborating with, called Jan van den Kiboom. He is an architect. He has a practice for 23 years. So they called him and they said, look, we are having all sorts of problems. This is Georgia Tech. Uh, students are having high degree of stress. We need a recreation center. We need to do something. So then they said, OK, let's forget everything. Let's go out there and engage with them. We are not designing for them. We are designing with them. Let's call them. It's for them. So let, let's ask them what they want. So they started um, studying. They started talking to the students. And they found that 82% of students said they have a high degree of stress. This is college students. Out of which 72% said, yes, we know there are resources. If we have high stress, we know that there are counselors to help. We know that there's a break space. We know that there's a sport that has been recommended for us to build down the stress. But only 13% utilize this. So these people were like, this is a problem we have to solve. What is going on here? So then they went and spoke to many students, conducted a questionnaire where they asked from morning to night, that is time, plot the graph of what you do during the day. Why is there a problem? Let's see. And each student came up with, oh, I have these high intensity times in terms of intensity, stress and intensity. I have this high intensity times, so I have to think too much, and then I go for lunch, I break, that's a relaxed time, I meet my friends, so on, right? And then they studied all of them and they found there were two types, predominantly. One is the Bactrian curve, a double humped camel, where these were mostly senior students. They studied, 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 and then they took a break. They had lunch, they relaxed, then they went back for some either sport or studying again, and then they would take a break again. This was a double hump camel and they did fine. These were the undergrad students, the dromedary, where they would start work and then they'd work, 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 work. They wouldn't know where to stop and then they'd crash at the end of the day. And this is where they were having alcohol issues, drug issues, um, substance abuse, and uh, mental health issues because your body can't take that. But they didn't have the time to actually go do something. They had so much work to do. So then Jan said, had this beautiful picture. He said, can we refuel them in flight? They are not going to break their classrooms, working their papers, and go to a recreation building and take a table tennis break or something, right? Because that's what you need. You saw that forest in the city. You're in city, 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 city. You need that forest break. So he's like, they are not going to get out. How can we refuel them in flight? So then they went back. This is a practical design, right? There is a building. They have to create a building. So this was the Georgia Tech campus. This is a, do you know what you're looking at? The plan from the sky, right? These are buildings that you're looking at an aerial view. And this is how the buildings were placed. And each building is a department. Engineering department, law department, something like that. I don't know exactly what they are, but they are like that. Studies, certain uh, departments of education. So each one being one one thing. What Jan did, that requirement that they had given him for a building, which was you know um, restaurants and eating spaces, recreational spaces, he made a recreational walking path in between these buildings and 
took each of those requirements and threw it across the campus, like spread it across the whole campus. So he would make interactive plazas and each of these plazas he created what is called thick space. Thin space is when you have a corridor, right? You have a corridor and you enter a classroom and this, that's populated with people. The corridor is not so populated. That's a thin space. Thick space is like a cafe. There is an inner space where people are buying things and that's lots of things happening. There's an outer space where people are sitting and eating. And there's a peripheral space where people are invited to join. They're looking at people talking. They think, okay, maybe even I want a break. Maybe even I want a coffee. If the coffee was in the next street, you won't think of it. The coffee is right in front of you and you see people talking, you will think of it. So he put each of these spaces, let's say a mental health kiosk and a cafe next to it. So he put the department of education is there, the, whatever the law, whatever classrooms are there, research labs are there. He put a thick space like a cafe next to it and also a recreational space near it, like a foosball table, whatever. And it's been found to be really successful what used to be like from IIT going from one department to the other became like a vibrant path. Students hang around a lot and it helps them unwind while they are going from one classroom to the other instead of being an empty walking space. So I just wanted to share with th this with you all because it just happened this week. So I was quite moved by how something has been done to actually improve lives of students and it's found to be successful also. It's lovely that they were able to go back and study and see how it's doing. In fact, a dining unit, a cafe, Starbucks or something, who had a shop somewhere in a rec center was moved here and they convinced them, they had to convince them to move. Saying you move here, you will see an increase in your revenues at least by 50% had a 400% increase. So it is also commercially viable now to have vibrant thick spaces. I will, uh, I'm doing okay on time, right? So now I've showed you our studies and how we approach architecture. I didn't talk about problem solving in on purpose. Um, I'll just touch on it. So what happens in our office? I'm coming to our office now. My personal relationship to my firm. Um, we have a client who comes and says, I have this 50 feet by 100 feet site. And by law, you have to give a little space from the compound wall because you shouldn't be near your neighbor and you, access to light, ventilation, everything. And so within that space, my challenge is I need these 20 spaces. Everyone is greedy. Everyone always wants more. You have to put everything in. And our job is to solve the problem by being the most efficient possible to fit in all the spaces, simply put, right? I do schools. Schools are the worst, except for Raji. <laughs> they will give you a space and they'll say, what is the maximum number of classrooms you can give me in that? And you have to tell them. <coughs> Sorry. Got a little over enthusiastic. Right? And you have to tell them, hang on. Don't think of it like that. The entire campus is a classroom. You can't look at classrooms as classroom. Yes, practical, but you have to change the way you think. If you can fit 20 classrooms, don't do that. Sculpt three or four out of it. Give some vague spaces. Let the students break from a biology class to a chemistry class in between with talk about, I don't know, just in, invite them to talk. Some people will anyway be talking, 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 talking. But some need that invitation to see that there's a gathering there. Maybe I can sit there and more people will, you know, let's create more spaces for community within that. So now you saw my multi-sensory approach, how we look at architecture. It's not just how it looks. I haven't even gone there because that's what architecture is today. You pick up magazines, who has the most innovative looking building? Like how does this look to you? That's just vision, guys. There's a lot more architecture can do. And that vision is what? Is how you look. You don't look the same all over, all through your life, right? You don't want people to react just to your face. You don't want to show your picture and say, that's me. There's a lot more. I would love to get beyond the magazine architecture. And that's why I didn't even touch that. But of course, if you do good looking buildings, you'll get more clients. 
<laughs> so to remember that. <laughs> but I try to convince clients that that's not what they want. So I will go through an example of how, in a small way, uh, there are multiple examples, so I'll stick to a simple one, how the multi-sensory approach and the problem-solving approach came together. So this was a 16-acre farm. Uh, these people had moved back from the US and they were going to do only farming. They had a tech life, PhDs, dropped everything and said, we want a fulfilling life. And they were doing research into bacteria and how it affected plant types and everything. And they wanted to live it. So they came back, they got the farm, they make their own, they make and sell organic lentils and vegetables and all sorts of things. So this was their farm and they said, we are so tied to it, we want to live there. Even if it's just every weekend, we'll see. Maybe we'll even move in there, but we need a house there. So they wanted a typical house, right? This was their requirement. Any house, right? Living, dining, eating. They had their kids' rooms, their own master rooms. They had two sets of parents, so two parents' rooms. So it is coming up to a pretty large house and in this huge farm. And that was the farm. Beautiful vistas all around and the temperature, it is in Hyderabad, it's outside Hyderabad. Temperature drops like 10 degrees when you go there because there's so much wind blowing. The smells are divine. And this is how they gave us and they said, build us a house here. So in a, they, there are a lot of details to this, but the simple concept is this. We took each of these spaces and made the farm flow between them. We didn't build a house. We built mini living cottage, bedroom cottage, kitchen cottage, servant cottage, also is within there. They also get the goodness of the farm. And the farm pretty much flows through the entire space. The details, of course, is that we use soil from their farm to make bricks, of course, completely with the help of the client. I have full thanks to her. Without her, we wouldn't even have attempted this. We made the bricks on the farm, fully organic. And we used lime plaster, no chemicals. So that's a whole new other talk, sustainability. I'm not even going to touch sustainability today because that's a talk by itself. But this was a fully sustainable farm. Septic tank was a bio reed bed. So your sewage was collected, then bacteria broke it down, and that water from that flowed to something called a reed bed where plants purify it and then when that purified water comes out it has so many nutrients it's brilliant for your farm so earth to earth nothing is polluting anything else nothing leaves the farm it's self-sufficient everything goes back and you are in touch with the farm every time you get out of a space and each space also remember I spoke about small space large space so your bedroom, cottage, you come out into a small space and then you go out into an enlarging community dining space, which is a large space. And it might seem like simple things, but they make a huge difference when you're actually on site. You're sitting in that small tinne for two, three people and you're talking. And then you walk into that huge dining. They had a music concert there. So it's a community space. These are what architectural drawings look like, by the way plans and sec that was a plan which is an aerial slice of the building right how you look at it from above she will know and your sections which will show you small bedroom spaces and how they become into that large community dining space and how most of it we left it open so the landscape can flow in. We'll have the kitchen garden right there. And it's all, you step out into an outdoor space from every space. No corridors, nothing. We use cement jali to filter light. Light is everywhere, but still we like having all light, filtered light, then completely inside enclosed light. Oops. These are the bedrooms. Again, you step out right, parents' bedrooms. They just step out and they have their garden right there. And the garden itself becomes a play thing. So we have to protect the doors from rain. We protected it. Then I'm like, what? We, that's so nice. It's right there. Let's walk from there. Our landscape guy was brilliant. He's like, 
hey, you can walk on to that and make a mound there. And from that, they directly access the garden. So all sorts of relations you're making here from the built space to the landscape space to the farm. That's what it looks like now. So you see your scale, suddenly you're above the building, suddenly you're under the building. Lots of place for you to read, Raji. <laughs> and also the landscape green, you have your own cozy green. Outside your bedroom, you have a walled off little lotus pond to this large pool outside. Sim sim self community in everything. And this is all purposefully designed, not by accident. Oops. So that was that project, which I hope our ethos kind of filtered into that for you enough to understand immediately how the thinking went for design. We didn't think about how will this look in a magazine ever. It was about how will the space feel? What will you think of when you walk into that volume? <coughs> I'll touch on my day. It's brilliant. We work with every, it's not a desk job. I love it. We work with everyone from electricians, plumbers, masons, stonemasons, carpenters, furniture designers, really hep stylists, rich clients, poor clients, all sorts of people, graphic designers, and each comes with their own love of their craft. And without talking to them, my job is incomplete. You're making a door for me. And he'll talk to me about the kind of wood. Madam, in the wood, panna, you know, they bring their own ethos because they love their craft. I can tell him, you shut up, I know better, I like this look of this. But he'll come with a story. He'll say, when you work with this uh, wood, this happens. And similarly to stonemasons, he'll say, now it looks like this, but 10 years from now, that marble will look like this. And you try this natural stone, it's better. And then he'll bring me a sample and say, madam, put your leg on it and see. So these, you have to grab these people. You have to invite them into your life. You can go to a shop and see it and say, I'll take that stone, I'll take that tile. But it's so much richer to say, I have a house with a tile, with a window. With I want to talk to these people who make that. What is there? Why are they there? What do you love about it? You're a carpenter. My carpenter's lovely. I could hug him every day. They're also bad carpenters. But my, so, you know, when they love their craft, it's a pleasure to have them in your life. Invite them. You're going out as students. But go there and see, what do I want in my life? What do I like? I'm seeing this work. I like this work, some art, let's say. Make an effort to actually find out who did it and go talk to them. Doesn't matter if you're a small student and they're a huge artist. Try and observe more and seek it out. Don't wait for things to happen. Of course, things happening to you is also a content way to be. Nothing wrong with that. But if you see something, pounce on it. You will find what you want the more you start observing yourself and seeing what you like around you. There's more chances that you'll find your passion that way. Even if you don't have a passion, don't worry. That's also fine. <laughs> but it just makes your life richer. That's my office in Hyderabad. My life is also a new global kind of life. I work in Chennai, my family is in Chennai, my office is in Hyderabad, my partner is in Hyderabad. Our projects are in Hyderabad, Chennai, Coimbatore, all over. We keep traveling. It's a new age office. I would of course love, have loved to be living in Hyderabad, but it doesn't work. I have to be in Chennai, but yet we have a different kind of relationship this way. And it still works. Nothing to... Um, you can't uh, replace this physical self, so I have to keep going there, which I love. Um, and my relationship with employees is another kind of dynamic. You have to, you can give them a job to do and say, okay, fine. Or you can say, what do you like to do? This is your strength. Mentor them. And then they tell you, madam, that day you told me that didn't work. And I've told them not to call me madam, but it's still, they still call me madam. So relationship to my boss, who's of course my friend only, my partner, relationship to interns, it makes for a very fulfilling life. You can ignore them or they can become an enriching part of your life. 
should i touch the business of architecture <laughs> this is one my weakness <laughs> obviously you can tell <laughs> came right at the end so um it is said it's not my thing it's said all over that architecture doesn't make money architects don't make money if somebody says there's a very rich architect my friend said probably inherited some money <laughs> you know it's not like making a phone where million people want the phone somebody wants you to design their space they have a limited amount of money and from that you have to design you have to pay your people so it it is limited in that it's not like a manufacturing unit where you can scale scaling is its own big problem because you want to design a house you want to design its knobs you want to design the door you want to design the railing when you do 20 houses you don't have the time to do all that then you have to do the same door uh, door knob in all the houses and at some point you're not going to like that it's a choice some people make that choice and say i'll just design the plan and you know i'll let go i'll make more money so that's a choice so the typical business is um the entire powerpoint presentation is probably like 20% of your architect life after that the ecosystem of architecture is another 20 30% where you interact with all these people and you have to get them to do your work for you and a large percentage is just getting the time right on site getting the drawings and getting it done so typically the client will come with their requirements which you then have to fit perfectly like a sign that's a problem solving of, of into the site and you calculate the cost and if and the architect's percentage is like the fee is a percentage of the cost typically nowadays they have different ways of calculating i'm going to stick to the simple one so it usually goes from 2 to 10% 2% is when you're designing a huge campus it's a master plan it's a university 10% of that will be like you'll say bye bye retire and go it will be that much they'll cost like 600 crores so yours will be 2% of that which is a few crores which will be enough to cover some costs and get some profits if you're doing just one house interiors let's say you can finish it in 40 50 lakhs so you see the scale difference so then you have to go 10% you 2% of that will be nothing you'll have to go by peanuts so that's sort of how the business works so then you have to wonder how much time am i taking to build a house how much time am i taking on a university obviously university is going to go over 10 years a house will get finished in 2 years interiors will get done even faster right i can do 20 interiors and do so the question is one is of course you have to go out there and get the project i forgot to add marketing business development is not my strength but it is a very big part of running your architecture firm so then you have to decide interiors are so quick i can just do 100 interiors forget about everything else you want to have a fulfilling life right you want to design spaces so you should have some of that some of houses and then accordingly market go to a school and say let me design the school for you but don't don't do 20 schools you can't handle that then i go to a house try and get some interiors that's my firm there are others who have scaled up multinational architecture firms who approach it differently so this is my angle that i'm giving it to you that's it i ended with the most uncomfortable part <laughs> any questions who which do any of you want to be an architect i know she already is any of you looking to study architecture yeah are you turned away from it or you still <laughs> for it how does it feel yeah you can do little design projects you know on your own just to sort of how would you design a room for instance your room thought about think about that now that i've told you would you think differently now would you say maybe in my room i might have a reading corner that's a small space something like that and a big larger area balcony right you're starting to put together things right you won't just say i have a bed i have a desk you'll start thinking how will i feel that yes no you already thinking like that <laughs> you are looking for architecture as well oh, no. okay. I, i probably want a uh, you know transparent roof after seeing that ah yes yeah. not if the sun is right there though see now you have to think about sun path diagram <laughs> where is the sun am i facing east or west yeah so probably i'll have get help from 
come up so there's a lot of problem solving for a psychology yeah. now i like you know what you like mm-hmm. so there's a problem to solve there and it's a beautiful career it's a beautiful field just the, the economics economy the commercials of it and the peop- ecosystem as well there will be a push and pull everything in life there will be a push and pull but uh, the more enriching you make it the more fulfilling it is and this was my way of making my career more enriching for me how do you compare your architecture then to centuries ago as well see then what happened one person wasn't allowed to have all these sensory things there was a person for grand there was a person for doing the lowly stuff right the architecture denoted what you were if you were a big person you got a palace if you were a priest you lived by the palace you had your own grand thing you look at the architecture you'll know who is living there right so the architecture defined the person really now we are saying we are equal equality is a big thing liberty freedom we want all of it we want grandeur we want simplicity we want introspection i think our architecture is sort of showing that as well people ache for that sort of grandeur oh, we don't design like that anymore they should go behind why it's more liberty now it's more flat space now london still has its palaces <laughs> Tamil Nadu is uh, depressing though. They, they built. Uh, we did recently did a Chennai tour, and uh, they showed us British colonial architecture. And uh, we were going past one giant building, and she's like, "This is the legislative assembly that Karunanidhi built. Legislative assembly is for politicians to meet and discuss politics. So it was just, it must have had halls and meeting rooms and everything." Jayalalitha came and said I am not putting my legislative assembly in uh, Karunanidhi's building and made it a multi specialty hospital That's like saying you damn architect you are irrelevant <laughs> I can put a hospital into anything So the thing is the sad thing is life will go on without design It's just that if you have a hospital where the bed has been designed with a view to a garden that person is going to heal better then if he's put in a legislative assembly meeting room with ac and no windows that's all so you have to be it makes you more conscious to what is around you any questions any discussions any points you want to raise of your own you can even go back to what is my favorite space and now i know why it's my favorite space i think i just want to share something that has happened very recently we are building the top floor open space and it has this arch to roof it right like this so uh, there is one room which is a little trapezoid and it's not uh, in a usual rectangular or circular shape and uh, while designing the slope it was done entirely the other way round without taking into consideration how the wind flows aha uh-huh. so now they are having to replace that whole thing only because the wind flow wasn't and nobody detected it the so what is what is the picture the drawing was right the but there was some communication gap and they uh, did it wrong it has been entirely relayed uh, you know uh, it has been laid differently so but what was the wind doing though no it will not allow the water to pass in one direction it would have uh, i think but in the wrong direction you would have had wrong, yeah, uh, water so in your hall have, uh, actually water would have fallen <laughs> so they had to take care of how the wind flows where will the water flow and now it's being redone but the architect had to take the cost because it was they said that it is their mistake and no, not by design mind you because they missed design. in the supervision correct it was missed in the supervision so i guess uh, since this has happened in the last two days these are the conversations that are going on and we are trying to see how it was even missed out you know while everything was yeah. laid um, so those are the finer No, no. I know many architects who treat their um, designs like babies. Then they will take the cost because they want their baby to be the best possible. Yeah. It's not something. It's not a job where they're just writing some code and forgetting about it. Not to put down coders. But <laughs> 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 so 
So thank you for coming. I hope I have enthused you towards architecture. We have some questions for you, Patmavashi. What? I just said questions. Oh, these are different questions. Most of people don't ask questions, so we're just trying to figure out if we can dig something into their mind and probably ask. Okay. How did you end up choosing this, Patmavashi? Let's say from your school days or wherever it is right now. So I used to sketch a lot, and there is this sort of conception, uh, this uh, thing that uh, if you're good at sketching, you'll be a good architect. Well, let me tell you, there's no relation. But there is a lot of drawing in architecture because sketching forces you to study space. So my dad said, um, you are inclined in that direction. He's a civil engineer, of course. That's the biggest influence. He's a civil engineer, so he was able to tell me what an architect does. So when he saw me sketching and there were buildings in my sketches, so that's all it was. I knew nothing about it. Okay. So then I also wanted to be practical and earn money. So then I said, no, no, I'll do computers. Mm -hmm. So then when we were applying for colleges, the college application said, uh, this was in Bangalore University. I said, uh, I like architecture also. Okay. It said list all that you like in order of priority. So I said, I want to make money, so computer science engineering, then architecture, whatever. Fate, it was just fate that I was slotted into architecture, I got architecture. Then I joined co the college, and then my dad said, you know what, I know somebody from the university, he can switch you to computers. I said, okay, and I went to college. The first three days, we had whole day design exercises, where they said, uh, design a stool the way you like it or what was your favorite building. We did exercises like this. And I told my dad, you know what, it's okay. I'll do architecture. <laughs> Forget money. <laughs> he warned me. He said, as an architect, you have to establish yourself. You have to go get projects. It's very difficult. You're a single girl. I don't have an office to give you. Usually, architects tend to have some familial support. That always helps because you come with a body of work. It's easier. I haven't done a single project. Who's going to give me a project, right? I have to go join a firm and grow with it. So he warned me about that. But after these three days of design exercises, I was like, I'm set. I'm good. <laughs> I never look back on that. Oh, I'm plenty looking back. <laughs> well, that was, what, 25 years ago? And there were many times when I was like, why am I in this? I am such a problem solver. I'm such a practical person. But I think that's why I'm in it, you know, to, you are already one thing. Let's enrich your life by uh, enabling other of your, you know, tingling your art sensors and all that. A constant question, but just, um, I, all I can do is enrich it as much as possible. And I mean, uh, a lot of millennials these days take a decision and they get bored with something in a couple of weeks and they want to try something else. And we've met uh, people who said that I don't want to do a job for more than a year. <laughs> they said I will work only for a year and after that I want to try something else, right? How, how that in the context of all your experience, you said you had a lot of opportunities for you to look back but you stuck on to it. But if somebody, let's say in the room, a couple of them saying they want to be architects, right? Now, how would you advise them? Do they take a decision, stick on to it for their life? It's like a marriage, right? If you're having abuse in the marriage, you already know you're going to cut off. You have to know where it's just not okay. This career is horrible for my senses. It's dumbing me down. You know it's time to quit. If you're just boredom, marriage, there's a boredom in the marriage, boredom in your career, you've got to give it some time and see, can I make it work? Which means you have to put your foot in actively and see how more can I, what can I put in to make this more invigorating. It could be changing a job or it could be in your job, be more proactive. We get interns, two types. We get an intern from an architecture school who will sit. They will be good in their plan sections, whatever. They will do, 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 do. They'll do their job the whole day and go off. There will be other interns who said, Ma'am, he's working on that project. I really like it. Can I do a bit of that? I love that. Be aware of what is happening. Look around. See what you like. Be bold about what you like. And go towards that. And I have to tell you, I didn't do much of that. I came from a cookie cutter school and in my college, I just did what I was told. And luckily there was a group around me, a group of girls, who came from such diverse backgrounds. I came from a very timid Tamil Brahmin background where my dad did a job and he said, you know, that is the safest thing to do. And my best friend's father was a businessman 
who would say you have to take risks and another best friend was from a film family they nobody else knows the art of risk like them so when you come from diverse backgrounds i actually sought them out again i could have stuck with five tambrams but you know it just helped me to see the anthropological effect of people from a particular community and how it shaped their thought all i wanted to do was study whereas the business people think in a completely different way they want to network it's just um delightful to observe how they think completely in different ways and i only think like this because of this field i think you know architecture helps you observe more when a client says i want to do this you have to observe them and see what you want and now uh, you you are a very uh, multi dimensional person and i know you love photography and yeah. you take beautiful pictures you're also into fitness calorie and all those things how how does this multi dimensional or multi disciplinary appro approach support you in your profession Uh, design architecture um great question. question no no it's a great <laughs> question i never thought of that i just thought i wanted my life to be multi pronged because it just makes my day to day really fulfilling to have a bit of see one thing i have found after all these i have lived all sorts of lives and now i know that when i'm learning something that day is so lovely so uh, my husband bought me a ukulele My husband's a musician. That itself makes my life way more interesting. He bought me a ukulele, so every day I sat and learned a chord. And I, you have to practice that chord twenty times before you can your finger will even stick there. And then now, after like so much practice, I can sing a full song. Now I'm not going to go there and on stage and do right. I'm not going to become a rock singer, but it feels so good. it's like so fulfilling you know you're nobody's going to look at you and say oh my god you're amazing but the self fulfillment of mastering something is something i want every day of my life you know and that's how i feel my life will i, I feel otherwise you tend to get bored you tend to get lonely fill it with some learning there's a lot of social isolation now right yeah. there's too much social media and all that yeah. i don't want to go there it's a loaded topic but everything in moderation yeah. and so for me filling my time with these activities makes it a lot more it's an active full active filling of my day how it affected my career is a question i haven't even thought of if i have to think about it i would say I'd bring my experiences to them and say look fitness um is a way of life I'm not sure I should think about that very well. <laughs> Music of course immediately I tell them right you have this large space you, this would be good for a musical gathering yeah, yeah. and so on. Um there must be intangible connections that I should I think, think about. Actually we were talking about this guy who works for Adidas. Okay. He 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 was not so very fit. He got into fitness and he does long distance endurance running. Apparently in his company he's now a preferred guy for projects which takes a lot of perseverance. Is, My gosh, that's a direct tough. reference. That's yeah. a really direct reference. Ah, oh, that's so a really good. Especially reference. goes through these long training periods, right? And he's often given the the laggards in the team. And he always takes them along and yeah. grows. I just had a thought because you said that. I do marsh. I do calorie pyto, and it's about flexibility and strength, right? Flex strength with flexibility, and I really think that's what I bring to my office. because my partner is very very passionate about design i am a lot more about people yeah. so when the client says i want this i bridge between them and i'm flexible between them and that's my strength i'm able to see the two make the two see eye to eye yeah. so subconsciously that's a very intangible connection but i'm seeing it now <laughs> it's, it's a really it's nice question it's a direct connection absolutely you I mean it's subconsciously it yeah. influence for who you are yeah. right if you were in multidisciplinary and you just wore the hat that I'm I'm an architect I'm just supposed to yeah. do this you wouldn't be who you are yeah. all right in that context if if somebody wants to be an architect today right what would you advise them to do if they're in high school or in college first year and probably they haven't chosen architecture as a course what would you advise them this is when the us universities start to make sense because you can take a bit of everything mm -hmm. i wish we had more of that here in the in india where you can take some mathematics you can say take some material study i didn't even touch material study you can study materials and see what how far they go and uh, 
design of course like i told you study what spaces do to people you don't need a course for that you can just look observe improve your observation skills uh, definitely observation 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 always see what a space does to people and then recreate that right um other than that visit places if somebody wants to be an architect definitely visit places um look for recommended buildings to go to that's what we do as we did as students we were going to goa for a party to just chill out but we would ask our professor what's a good building to see there so he said charles korea's uh, that uh, forget the name now it's not coming to me it's one museum with uh, an amphitheater and everything go see that and we're blown going there you know when 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 architecture is designed beautifully you're like oh, my college could have been like this it's so beautiful look at all these yeah. lovely spaces we could have had an amphitheater just a space like an amphitheater is so fun you know levels heights yeah. you, you can clump around in a corner there can be a stage focused attention such a versatile space any favorite uh, architecture that you guys Yeah now that you said space now let's move to buildings any what do you think is a nice building in chennai we got limited <laughs> so i like this building called the ala medica where is it it's in stockholm it's like uh, it's my dream university is a uh, building so it's your dream like university a, yeah you're a high school student no i'm uh, <laughs> undergrad you're going to like that <laughs> <laughs> my undergrad yeah what did you do your undergrad in biotech Okay, uh, and why is that your dream university? Because of technical reasons or like beautiful place? No, no, technical reasons. It's a medical okay. university. I like to work. Okay. So it has a very beautiful building. It's like a glass. So you're attaching your love of the technical to the building also could no, be. No, no, <laughs> it is a lovely even building. Even yeah. The architecture of it was so beautiful, even inside. Okay. Yeah, so See, the abroad everything is so designed with all the psychology in mind. You know, it's a very subtle thing. Why do we go there and we're impressed by it? But if you think more, they are paying attention. In India, you go to a Ramaniam. Don't tell Ramaniam. Chopped. They want Chopped. as many houses as possible, with no thought to even landscape. You go to an apartment building, twenty apartments, one pot. Whereas the Vishnanti dev developers who did my house, they took care that the parking entry was not given attention and gave a few beautiful garden in front. and left the trees as is let the trees come on to the building a little bit and wherever the tree vis visual was there they put glass they are thinking that at least they like we care you know you get it from that little difference that's it i came across this picture once i don't remember who exactly showed it i think it was in one of my uh, it's in school in one of the classes so we were talking about environment we came across this picture of a tree house so it was a house in middle of a forest It's surrounded by the forest completely, but you do have access to the city too. I after seeing that picture, like how the inside of the house, I just I just wanted to live there. Yeah. At like some point, at least in the future, I wanted to like live in a place like that, in a house yeah. like that, because the house looks so beautiful. It was like with the nature, and and the nature like, makes you feel good, right? It's a proven thing. It's not a cliche. It's, it's a just, proven I, thing. I wanted, like, living around nature. Felt like. Just looking at the picture, I felt like very calming and peaceful. Like I could focus actually on yeah. what I was doing. No, so it is a proven thing. The thing is, apartments are a necessity because if every person, seven billion people, are given each a personal garden, there won't be any earth left. So you have to clump the people, but we have to also take our little. In that, what can we do? Yeah oh my god i had a slide for it i was parsing down the slides and i pulled it out but i had spaces that pavilion no and step 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 park roof irku mela also the stage thing just a minor angle that stage but the lifting feel of that space is like really you should think about why i don't know i'm starting to think the materials the light that comes in the informality of it There's a certain equalness to everyone sitting there. It's it's just a beautiful place. Places is really wonderful. I used to have my Kalari Paita classes there. Uh, one of our students is pursuing architecture, and uh, in one of the colleges here, 
and he says that his teacher, who has to approve the designs that he makes as projects or whatever, doesn't like circular designs. And she says that you have to make uh, a square so that uh, you know circles don't actually have good space utilization. So in uh, uh, basically in terms of just getting the logistics right, you're giving away creativity. And I guess what would we tell architecture students? And he is bound by that person, right? That teacher, you will have to give only what she wants, or else she's not going to accept your project, right? So these are the things that they will be, I don't know if you're experiencing in your uh, you know, day-to-day -day works as an architect. So how can they uh, live with that to do whatever, but also do things differently? How do they? Choose your teacher wisely. <laughs> you can change your fate. Um, that's what I'm saying. Be more proactive, right? We had three bad teachers and one really excellent visiting prof. So the timid ones will go where they're grouped. But the ones who know that that man's magic, like I didn't, I was luckily put under him. But there were people who went to him and said, sir, I'd like to be under you, please. You can change that. Or be under your bad teacher, but go talk to the good one. First of all, be observant enough to see what is happening, that there are three and there's one bad. Pay some attention. Always be more proactive. Timidity will not. At least observe. Even if you're timid in your corner, observe what is happening in that corner. And let it inform your next decision. Okay, so now I want to pursue architecture in the later years. I'm in ninth grade currently. So what do I have to do, like starting from now? Do I have to do something if I want to take that field? Do I have to like focus on something specially or some some subject or something like that? Um, I know that most architecture colleges, including Anna University um, Architecture School, School of Architecture and Planning, um, the best one is in Ahmedabad, Center for Environmental Planning and Technology, SEPT Ahmedabad, SPA Delhi, School of Planning and Architecture Delhi. Um, and then I think Srishti School of Design, I don't know if it has architecture. There are some really select, wonderful schools. They all have a drawing test. And drawing by meaning, by that I don't mean looking at something and reproducing it. They'll have something like, for example, one year, the year I did it, I didn't do the entrances, I got jaundice, but one of the things was, what's your idea of a person picking up a syringe and injecting someone? So I don't think they're looking for the perfect drawing. They're looking for how you're expressing it. Try it. Just try it. Build a body of work. of just Because sketching is how you observe space. And observation of space is all architecture is. So when you're sketching, what is the scale of the tree to the person? It can be any kind of sketching. Definitely sketching will help. Um, mathematics. I had an intern, I told him, divide that door into five parts and then leave a little six inch window and he was struggling with <laughs> that. I'm like, dude, <laughs> you do need mathematics for architecture. That's a stupid example, but you do need mathematics because you'll be studying strength of materials. Like, I wish I had been more proactive in studying physics of materials, how steel reacts. I would be a far better designer but right now I completely rely on my structural guy to tell me which I'm just taking I would love to have that knowledge on my own but some things a small head a few things at a time on, oh. the, on the topic of like what you can do I think two summers back I attended this workshop it was like a 10 day workshop where um, we were told what to expect in architecture and we were like so we visited a firm saw their building. Oh, that's lovely. What they did there. We were also taught the different softwares and like just given an idea. And in the end, we did like a full presentation of whatever we did to our parents, to other people who came in. Okay. That really like helped and... Who offered this workshop? It's, I think by, they have, they started a firm now. It's Pinwheel Design Studios. Okay. So there were students who offered the workshop. No, they, they, they were, they were architects, practicing architects yeah. who offered the workshop. And, but uh, that's a great thing to do. So that's like architects getting involved with the community and with students. That's absolutely what they do abroad all the time and we should uh, be doing. So that's a great initiative. What we do is we go for juries in colleges, but that's at college level, it's not at school level. So this is fabulous to hear. Maybe you could take that information from me. A couple of questions from uh, 
uh, how, leading from how to estend. Is architecture like medicine? You need to be a certified architect to build, or do you need to? Yes, you need to be a licensed architect. Okay. Um, so here the licensing process is not too complicated. You get, uh, graduate and then you send your degree in and the Council of Architecture will check all your credentials and give you a license. And you so have to formal keep education is required to be an architect? Absolutely. I do know of, um, you know, India, no. They'll have a, an architect sign off on the building but the design is done by their niece or nephew and who's not a... So all that is possible, but yes, as a legal thing, definitely you need to be a licensed architect to sign off on your sheets. And if somebody who's chosen an alternate path who's interested in design, is there is there something that he can do to be in the space of designing buildings or he needs to go back and get a formal degree to work in this space? That's can they take any short-term programs? Short I know programs? abroad there is. I know abroad if you haven't done an architecture degree, you can actually apprentice there is a very systematic approach to it. India, I'm not aware of that. So if you don't have a degree in architecture and you're like 35 and you don't want to go to college, I don't think legally you can. I'm not sure I might be wrong though. Okay. I find that out. The other part you mentioned about math and physics connection with architecture, right? I mean, in, in the current courses, do they cover that? I mean, your, your course where? Yeah, we had like a light touch of it. Okay. We had strength of materials. We did have mathematics in the first year. Um, so they do cover it a little bit. So perhaps even if they pursue a architecture degree, you recommend that they take some additional programs outside of architecture to, to have the knowledge of physics and math like you mentioned. Is, is that something you would recommend? While them? doing architecture while or doing in school? While doing architecture or in school, what would you recommend? No, no. It's, in architecture, they have already strength of materials. Okay. Just pay attention. <laughs> like I've got this long without paying attention. I kind of barely like studied a little bit, but I was like, all uh, the glamorous world of design was had my attention then. Uh, I'd like to add to that. Uh, we have strength of materials and uh, structural design uh, subjects or in theory in our course and curriculum. But uh, it was like they never related that to architecture or design. So we did, we, we had calculations to see the compressor strength, tensile strength and all that of columns, beams and all that. But they never uh, applied to practice. So suppose I'm designing something and I want like this uh, 10, 12 meter cantilevered structure. And it is possible abroad, like there are techniques for it, but they never uh, kind of uh, attach the practice and the theory together. It was just like, okay, you have a, a, a one feet by uh, one feet beam going, and then in these intervals you need these columns. It yeah. was very systematic. It was very detached, yeah. I agree so with you. Never able, so when I'm designing, at the end they'll ask, uh, how are you going to structurally support the design that you're designing? At that time, I wouldn't be able to actually apply what they taught me here because what they taught me is very like struck like an engineer. Like a it's engineer theory. Stuff. Yeah. Very theoretical. No, to add to that, I had a friend. I have a friend, Venila, who's an architect who's teaching in College of Engineering. I mean, the Gindi College of Architecture. What is it called? SAP, School of Architecture and Planning. She had this exercise where they studied uh, structurally steel strength of materials. And then she made them do an exercise where they would select an existing structure like a bridge or a roof, steel roof structure done by a very famous architect and it's a world famous structure like say Eiffel Tower. They didn't do Eiffel Tower, it's very complicated but other like more, more modern buildings and they, she had them recreate it with models. So if it is a hung bridge, they had to study how to hang it. The, the, the bridge had to be stabilized over here and then this hang you know how, yeah, how this, it's, it's actually very simple and doable. I didn't know she, till she told me that even in a small model, the same physics applies yeah. if you use like the right materials. So that was a lovely way of tying structure with what you a, a design thing. Yeah. So that could be done a lot more, but that's for like a architectural education workshop. There are very few people who think it that way. Yeah, yeah you, it's a very hard to relate. I, I still have, uh, I want a class with my structural engineer who does for us, just get some ideas. With, with all this automation, AI and 
commoditization of most industries what what do you see happening in future of work in marketing ai is very exciting we do a lot of it now so we had our ai consultant come by he's a mad man he's only thinks like in wires and you have to like bring him down say tell me how i can understand no how does this work so he'll say you come here i'll give you this keypad you press this this is will happen it will set a scene so it's quite it's like that um pull of social media no it's very exciting to see all that um i'm yet to see how without being engulfed by it how to tap its potential but i think there is a lot of potential you see that becoming a threat to professions where human beings sit in design where a system would come and would oh ai it. isn't designing yet yeah. i see ai as a an <coughs> part of my enabler, as an enabler. project yeah. Yeah. yeah as a tool yeah but as does is it also a threat for professions like these where human intelligence is being questioned by machine intelligence so architecture is something long before the advent of ai non architects would design because you can yeah architecture is not like making a phone yeah. making a building anyone can do it you didn't need to be an architect yeah. right anybody can the mason can build his house it's not an esoteric field it's more like generic it's like having a garden you don't need need to be a landscape artist so in that sense i don't think ai is going <laughs> in more like mason staking 90% of buildings in chennai aren't designed by architects okay the contractors will do their own thing it's more problem solving of i have this much space in yes. that i want maximum offices that's what it is it's like a numbers game so this is like how to take make art out of that okay so it, in terms of the future there is there's not much of a disruption as such it's constantly being disrupted through the years yeah it's so, already a disrupted field yeah so coming of an automation or ai is not really going to yeah. change much yeah i'll yeah i'll have to i'll i'll have to say architecture is not as in an immediate requirement as say doctors okay and teachers uh, or farmers it is a luxury field yeah. so to speak but just like environmental psychologists who study what it does to the brain it can make a difference it's a subtle thing that can make a difference and enrich lives yeah. so what do you think if you were exposed to when you were young so before you did your post grad or undergrad what do you think what you were exposed to could have made you much better much better architect or oh, something like what you great question job? great question i was brought up in such a cookie cutter setting I did not know to this day I feel that restraint I cannot think out of the box easily I find it very difficult I did my masters in sustainability and uh, and in in London architectural association and they are a very path breaking forward looking institution and the first thing I went there I I had in my head a textbook where they will teach me you know sustainability means how to save water how to Uh, do passive design how to use sunlight lighting and i'll study all that and i'll top the exam i go there and they're like pick something you want to study and tell us what something new that we don't know already i was like what <laughs> i don't know how to do that nobody taught me how to do that you teach me something and i'll give it back to you much better than you thought i would i had no clue how to even approach this kind of a thing I did struggle through it but I think it changed me as a person. I'm struggling to get out of that you give me something and I'll max it kind of an setting. It's been 20 years I'm still doing that. But um it's a great question really. Um upbringing matters a whole deal. They should allow students to think on their own, have their opinions. trust their instincts do you know it's not just what you're told it's what you think also like my child started asking me about kashmir i'm not going to tell him the facts i'm going to tell him there's a lot of nuance there they didn't tell us that while growing up they just told us this is what you have to think and the people who came to my masters came up with things that i was like how did they even think of that you know and i definitely wish I think I would have been a different person. I'm happy with the way you have to grow. You are here, you grow there. It doesn't matter if somebody is there and they grow there. It's about your own journey, right? Where where you are coming from. How about intern 
scholarship opportunities for children who are pursuing architecture? Do you know of firms in Chennai that offer? Yeah, yeah. not for high schoolers, I don't know. But if some high schooler were to come to us and say, I'm really interested in architecture, we would welcome them. They don't. So that's why I say grab your opportunity. If you think you like architecture, go talk to, talk to me. I'll put you onto someone else. Network. You have nothing to lose. So go see how they work. I don't know how they would work with us. I mean, I'm sure we can find ways of fitting them in. And in one week, you will know what we do. In one week, you'll be able to just, you'll figure it out. This is what they do. And then the nuances will come. The nuances, you will, you will have your own life to figure out. But it's lovely to already know, this is what architects do, I know what they do. So go out there, ask, go see. College interns, we get all the time. The, um, like, you, did you do your internship? Yeah. Where? I did it in Chain Lab and Associates, uh, Chennai. Okay. Lots of designs going on, and like you're not allowed. To, there's no time to think. People have already designed for you. You just have to like draft it down. No, I would say so as an intern. Of architecture, and I'm glad I've, I've been doing <coughs> this, so I know what it is. Next. No, so our interns also design toilets, mind you. So um, when I get an intern, um, I'll the interns do toilets. That's like a rite of passage. You have to do toilets. And you won't believe how badly they design toilets. And I'll tell them, you crack that, you will know how to crack anything. You know, where to put the pipes, where to put the wash basin, where to put one small exercise like that has so much thinking to do. But of course, if they're going to sketch everything and all you have to do is like make drawings of it, you can ask them, can I do a sketch for you? Be proactive. You say, I know there's a toilet required. Can we do this layout? Be ready to be shot down. I tell all my interns that. Don't think you're a bad designer just because I'm going to tell you that was shit. You come to me with 10 things. I will shoot all of them down. You're going to learn something. I'm not telling you you're a bad designer. You, you will learn nothing by sitting in your chair. You have to be ready to be shot down and go ask. It doesn't matter. So you drafted toilets. <laughs> Try, see what you can learn from that. You have to make everything a learning process. Nobody else is going to do it for you. That, what I learned from that was more of like detailing and how like materials are joined together. Absolutely. Like, like the detailing part of it, I was able to yeah. If you can get your immediate boss to involve you in that, why did you do this? Ask the questions. I love it when my interns ask me questions. We weren't allowed to like talk to our chief architect. So. <laughs> what do you mean not allowed? <laughs> Who does that? Why not? What about your immediate project architect? Uh, yeah, that was, that was about If you're not having a dialogue in a firm, I would say go to another firm because ideally any good architect uh, office will have a lot of dialogue. will have a lot of, what do you feel about this? You tell me. I'll tell you you're dumb, but that doesn't matter. You tell me what you think because you don't know anything yet. But you should have an opinion. You should be bold and say it. It doesn't I matter. From that was they made us work like from 9 in the morning till 8.30 night and then 8.30 night was always like we will have to ask them a lot and we like beg them and then if they are like in a good mood they will allow you to go and sometimes we will have to go come on Sundays, on national holidays, all that. It shouldn't be that just for the sake of. Yeah, but that made me like if I were to go to a smaller firm who let me uh, actually interact with the client or like at least be there in the client meeting, I'll be more uh, like I'll, I know this part of it also. I know this the hard work or like the like how much goes yeah, into it. Yeah. Like I know this part of it. You know why that happens? So architects make very less money. So the faster you do it, there's money in it. Yeah. So it's unfortunate but that's sort of what it is. You won't believe the kind of internship I had. So this guy was a mad genius architect, but he believed in the passion so much, if you had a wrong drawing, he would tear it and throw it at your face. So I was like, should I put up with this abuse to get this knowledge? Eventually I did. I have some scars, but I also learned something. Yeah, that's how it is. I was glad I at least I was bold enough to say, okay, fine, I'll put up with that nonsense. 
but I do have long term scars because of it. Whenever, like, after finishing my internship and uh, in the college, like, our staff would ask, What did you learn? and what, how was your experience? I'd always tell them, I'm glad I went. I went there, like, to know what you don't want. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm yeah, I'm glad I went there. It's like a one side, I saw one side of architecture and that in some parts it's also correct and I can use that in uh, wherever I go, whatever I pursue. Also. Yeah. You want to ask a question? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm in college right now. Doing what? Uh, English. I'm doing English. Okay. So, but I wanted to do architecture and, uh, since I was like 8th or ninth, and then life happened so I basically had to change my things. stuff. Uh, so I want to do interior designing okay. and someone told me that you have to finish architecture and do interior designing. Not really. Yeah, no. but I never understood it and then I lived uh, thinking that for like three years and I never questioned it. And then I was like architecture and then interior designing. I'm really happy at the place I am right now. Do you think I can still do interior designing after? Absolutely. So generally uh, they have this attitude that if you know architecture you can already do interiors. And just like a mason can do architecture, an architect can do interiors. <laughs> so I can design wardrobes for you and make it even look nice. But a really good interior designer can get such a feel inside with textures and colors inside a building, a school, house. And it's a fine art, I think, that I personally don't think I've honed my skills. And I would really... Um, it will be great if you can get an interior designer because they think in a completely different scale of how these little, little things will add to a space. So uh, there, there are diplomas in interior designing. You can do, I think, one or two year diplomas. And uh, weirdly enough, I think English is tied to it because there's a lot of language I feel that, you know, interior designers <laughs> use. They are like stylists and they it's like being a fashion designer you know you need to be in uh, with the trends you have to have a certain thing for that yeah. Yeah. Uh, practical tambram like me you know I love it though I love watching them I love watching fashion designers and uh, interior design you can absolutely do a diploma any names you want to suggest architects or uh, interior designers you could follow in social media for inspiration <laughs> Locally, um, I love the stuff done by the Good Earth designer, uh, Saumya, I think her name is. Generally, because I have a personal relationship, one of our buildings, she had done something. So she puts together art and the light frame and somehow she connects that. With this light frame, this kind of art will be nice. I don't even know how they do that. And this kind of rug. So they have to think of every element inside your space. So an architect can't go to that depth. It's a whole new field by itself. But the problem is then the client has to pay for the architect, pay for the interior designer, pay for the stylist, for the lighting guy. So it becomes a again a rich people thing. That might be a problem, but it is still an art. Like even fashion designing is a rich people game, but that, that shouldn't deter you. Art is art. Literature to architecture actually. Once we had a guest lecture from uh, Neil Schoenfelder of Mansi Design, and uh, he had taken inspiration for an, uh, like a weekend uh, villa for one of his clients. He had taken inspiration from one still of a, like a novel, <laughs> like, a, uh, like this witch going through like uh, something like caves, like, uh, like rocks around going through something towards this uh, castle where the like the prince or princess are, are and she's like trying to go there and uh, like you know destroy whatever they are going to do so this is this well the story thing. makes the space way more interesting doesn't yeah. it so like dolmens if we had stood next to it and nobody told us the story it's dead to us yeah. so the story this like this very old english novel so it, made, it wasn't like this disney uh, thing or anything so he had translated that into design where uh, the approach to the dining, he enters through the dining space actually. It's not much of a living space, it enters through the dining space. And it, there are these like uh, rocks around and uh, full water body. And you wouldn't, you'll have to walk on stepping stones. Like, so you feel on, the yeah. water and everything. So, and the texture of the rock also. Just walk on stepping stones and go into the dining. And the dining is not like a room. 
the floor of the dining is also filled with uh, still water. Like is this that. in Chennai? Uh, I think it's in Goa. So okay. This is a like project. Like one of the theme, theme based hotels and all. Oh, theme based hotels. So you, you were saying? He, he had a question. So I had a question along probably a completely different uh, line of thought. Um, you've heard of biomimicry design, which is, yeah. uh, like for example, you know, the Shinkansen, the bullet trains in Japan, which uh, they designed it, you know, based on the elements yeah, of nature, yeah. I think birds, beaks, Correct. etc. How does this translate into architecture, you know, what are designs that are inspired by nature, for example? I think there's a lot. Um, shapes wise i know there's a lot of that fibonacci series all that that they translate into structures for sure that's a direct visual link golden ratio, I think. sorry it's called the golden ratio or something like golden ratio so we take a lot of ratios from nature and how the trunk size to the branch size there's a proportion in uh, biology anything related to biology is always a proportion Proportions become very important in architecture. They shouldn't tie you down, but but uh, I can't think of any other like shock and awe examples <laughs> of biology. But I'm sure there's a lot of bio inspired. Taking from where Guru left, I mean, I read this. Uh, oh, Keratin Skandalama was one. It's not bio mimicry, okay. but it was a hotel in a forest. And he literally brought the. Uh, forest foliage inside the hotel. It's a beautiful hotel in Sri Lanka. Heritage Kandalama. This is Jeffrey Baba, brilliant architect. And he's a lot of nature inspired architect. So if you have a chance to look up Heritage Kandalama, look at it. The hotel, he brought the forest into the hotel basically. And it's stunning. Taking from where he asked in terms of spaces or you know things outside of their scope of work influencing the work. It said that uh, Steve Jobs' work was highly influenced by the room house he stayed in. Really? So iPhone's linear structure is inspired from the uh, the way his house was architected. Okay. And that guy, in turn, was arch uh, designed, influenced by Lego blocks. Ah. Uh. Um, so there's this story that connects all of them. So, how much of this multi-sensory uh, design is restricted only to architecture? So there are people who are not architects who are technology or building products. How do you bring in your sense design of design? Design is multi-sensory. Yeah. When I say multi-sensory design, it's not just architecture. It's with fabrics, it's with anything. Multi-sensory design is just opening your mind up saying, don't design just for visuals. There's a whole other dynamic around it. So absolutely, it would apply to jewelry design, anything. Could it be in, in relatively boring profession like the coders, right? Look, how can we how do can, an arm? How can we bring in <laughs> design into... You tell me. Maybe ask the coder, programmers. Uh, what is your background? Marketing. Wow. Marketing is all about people. No? So coders, coders. Yeah, what is your day like? Coding is art. It's, it is art? It is. <laughs> Two thing, guys. Uh, but it's a very focused art on one thing, huh? You're like... How do you perceive? Does it have so a have community a aspect, for yeah, instance? Like we have motifs that we use to grow a big structure. Uh, yeah. Uh, we do a small system. thing. Yeah. You're looking for a small thing that can then build up and become a. Yeah, the language is. It's about structure. Yeah, and, uh, it's, it's, the language is different. We call it primitives and things like that. But you know. I should sit for one of their <laughs> classes. <laughs> what is the basic uh, <coughs> logic? basic logic of design that you were saying, it, it may not be sensory sensory and all that, but there is a logic to design, right? If you don't build it properly, it becomes difficult to expand on it, it becomes difficult for people to come in and keep contributing to it. it, it I it's see, a, so you're, it's, a living it's like you do a half a Lego block and someone else must be able to come and continue the Lego block. Yeah. They're building on it. So it's a different, it's a different <coughs> language. That's why I said it's not the language that you speak, but there's a lot of business. But it. it is more problem solving. Yes, think about, you, you take a building, you build it, it's done. Right? Yeah. Code lives. It's a living organism. Mm. Right? Which you would say of buildings as well, because you, it might keep changing its function yeah. and purpose and shape and so yeah. on. Okay, but yours in a much bigger way. It keeps, keeps changing by the minute, by yeah. the hour, by right. the day. You know, it's a living organism. Right. You need right. to 
thing. It's a lifelong thing. It's a completely different way of looking at. Do you guys get inspired from non-tech sources too? Yeah, Let's I say, for example, music. Of, I learned most of coding from music. So. Ah, see, that's a direct link, right? Music, math, coding. Not Ragun keeps link, pulling that link up. Direct, not a direct link, but uh, you learn a lot about form and function. Right. What do you put together? I mean, it happens only when you're able to connect those dots from several domains, and when you are when you are aware of uh, other things that are happening around you, then you can start seeing how can I bring elements of it in the coding. The accessibility, for example, how do you make it accessible for people? Uh, That's so that's beautiful when you say music, right? The form and structure of it appeals to them, whereas the um, the you know when you go from soft to a crescendo, the, I can relate to that in architecture. I want to build that feel in architecture. But music combines the two. Yeah. Of course, architecture has a structure as well. Taking off from what he said, there is a direct. Uh, there is no. I mean, there is software that runs standalone in some corner of the world that does some work. But a lot of software also interacts with humans. Right. So, I mean, there is a look and feel to it. I mean, you have seen the so you're designing a software to be able to talk to a human. Yeah, most of the software interacts with humans, right? Look at the UX design and all that. Right? These are all. There's a lot of. You have to put yourself in someone's sensory, shoe. Sensory things there. I don't think. I mean, when you look at an app, yeah. there's so much of. Coding is not about banking software alone. Right? You have haptics where you actually can touch. Okay. Can design things <coughs> with your hands, and that's all coding. Too. The UX and the UI portion is extremely important. They have a design philosophy and. Absolutely. And you know they hire architects for that actually. I was they just do? going to ask okay. because um, uh, today we know that there are psychology students being hired in software firms to understand UX and if they are able to communicate. So. Uh, One of my employees went to the US to study. Uh, it's a three-letter acronym, <laughs> but it's human interface. It's yes, human computer. HCI, yeah, HCI, HCI, and she said they're hiring architects because we know how it goes, how, how to think of moving from place to place, like a room to room, and designing in volume, and going through a website is very similar. You have to know how to lead the person, or something like that. And I was I'm quite astounded by that. Space so that you can lead yeah, yeah, the yeah. Where you want and what they, what you want them to see, like that cheap dog again. Yeah. You want them to behave in a certain way. You can force them to click a button. Just yeah. Exactly, put a color, all that, right? So you have to study then, what will people click more? Okay. Yeah. I'm wrap it up with just two questions. The architect, yeah. uh, children want to be architects, who doesn't want to be architect? How about Ayn Rand? Yeah. yeah. You guys know? Okay. Yeah. Okay. How much of it is real? Overdraw, can a overdraw exist? It's like unidimensional. For one year of my architecture life, I wasted on her thinking, <laughs> oh, architect is this lofty idea. There are so many star architects today that I can't stand their work because it stands there as a temple to their ego <laughs> and nothing else. Of course, it will generate some economy, but that's the same as a circus or a, you know, any anything that grabs eyeballs. The company's house. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, there are these other firms like Jan Van Den Kiboom, whose study I showed, he doesn't want his name to be shown. So it's like what he's designing enriches him as well as the person he's designing for. It's not just his ego, he's tapping all parts of himself. So it's a relation just, between... It's all jazz and no reality in, in the whole Howard Ruck's image. You can't be him if you, if you really have solved Absolutely, it's unidimensional. There's nothing to be done without, uh, you know, collective. Talking from unidimensionally, you come from a family with both of you have taken a <coughs> call that you're going to take an alternate path. You know, yeah. You're not following a... Uh, road that's laid with somebody else. As a summary, you know, not just for children or students who want to be architects, but any any student in high school or college, what would be your three or four life lessons that you would want to share to lead a fulfilling life, not just careers? This I touched on already, which yeah. is learning, and learning not just related to your career, any sort of learning. Learn to draw. I had a friend <clears throat> who has a background in tech. But now she's just a parent who's, who's at home taking care of her children and her parents. She did a 100-day watercolor challenge for her and her friends. So every day they just, and they started off so like rudimentary. At the end of 100 days, because they've seen masters and re tried to recreate that, they're really good. 
and really filling your uh, life with s allied learning, some other learning, something else will enrich your life in ways that are intangible but the dots will get connected. So definitely keep learning every single day of your life. This whole path of school, <coughs> college, work, retirement, can't just like we need that break from the that thin uh, really, uh, transactional space into a reactional space. We need in our life, from our career, we need those little landscaped areas, which is the learning breaks, just like to enrich our lives, the fitness regimes, the walks to the beach for no reason. My Every day I go for a walk in the morning and evening with my dog to the beach. And I never thought it will change my life so much, you know. Every day just seeing that beach will make every stress seem inconsequential. Which if I didn't go, it wouldn't happen. Design your day with that kind of a variety. Which you had uh, spoken about earlier also that you need to communicate with designers, plumbers, carpenters, uh, and all of that. And that is a little unlikely to any other profession, right? Be it software, maybe entrepreneur. Why does it have yes, to be, really? It's, um, uh, so, you know, a message for the uh, budding architects over here because everything that you're talking about is being able to communicate with different people who are bringing in different ethos and different stories. And I know as a fact that the best architects have the best teams, the go-to people, yeah. how you say structural team, yeah. you need a carpenter. So how we might be uh, glamorized by the fact that we have a degree, but if we don't know how to build these networks, teams. we may not be able to you know, do well in this profession. So Nothing to add to that, Raji. <laughs> you said everything. Not only is it good to for the purpose of having a team, yeah. but you learn so much. Like my plumber, every time we go to the site visit, I don't just check. I'll chumma, I'll bug him with one question. Why do you do this? Why didn't you take this to the ceiling? Why did you take this from the floor? And there's always something they can tell me. Because their experience is something I will never have. So I am trying to absorb as much as I can from every person I meet in my career. Yeah, what, what encoders, what, what kind of allied people do you we have? We work with educationists, we work with bankers, we work with uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable uh, uh, policies and sustainable policies. Several other domains. So right. We have to understand how they work together. I think sustainability is something that's really wonderful in that it makes you think outside of your career and how it impacts, right? That one thing itself has changed our lives. I didn't put it on purpose. Raji, because somebody should talk on that, only on that. Yeah. A great person to talk about is actually Didi Contractor. Uh, she's based in, uh, I think, in Himachal. <coughs> and uh, she's based, I think, 90 years old now. And, uh, 90? 90. Oh, wow. And uh, she doesn't have a background in, uh, in design itself. And uh, she's a self-taught architect. Uh -huh. uh, she's actually from US, and she married into uh, a Mumbai family. Uh, and her design is entirely about being sustainable. She builds bricks from you know the soil that is present there. Right, right. We did for that. And uh, I mean, uh, to know more, I think you should watch this documentary. It's called the Earth Crusader. Sure. And uh, she's she's this amazing person. Yeah. Uh, probably look at Sounds it. great. Awesome. We met Sonam Wangchuk also mm -hmm. recently. He was so inspiring. All right. So we're, 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 okay, last question. You know, Mike's that, uh, design attempt comes in the way of functionality. What? Design comes in the way of functionality. Uh, several examples. Like simple example is in our apartment, there's an elevator uh, entries through one side, exit is through the other side. Uh, the elevator goes up and down more often than it has to. So, uh, I don't understand. It's an elevator with two doors? Yeah, two doors. Okay, double sided yeah, elevator. Double -sided. So people always turn and turn facing the door. They don't see the uh, door behind them. So it goes down again to the ground. They miss it completely. Yeah, miss the door completely. <laughs> That's so funny. Back. I see strange things too. Sometimes people will be. Uh, oh, God, we're doing that in one of. We're putting that elevator in one of our apartments now. I'm rethinking that. Yeah, so uh, there's so much uh, going on in this one, that one elevator. So comes a lot in the way of functionality. Uh, 
mean design and architecture design per se not you can actually that happens a lot where yeah. design has been forsaken for the sake of functionality Correct. for instance you know in a hotel thing you don't have space so you put a doubly loaded corridor all hotels have so there's no light but that's the best way to get maximum room so the rooms all get light but for me to just walk through that horrible corridor with that strange ac smell it's just killing me isn't there another way to do it you know so you always prioritize functionality or is there something that we should promote or see functionality you can't get out of you have to give that but like i said about the school what you can do is you'll tell them you what are you going to do with 10 more students don't earn that much it's okay but give the existing students enough recreational space nobody will do it but i'm just saying that we always push and there are architects who have become builders because is so fed up with builders builders will want maximum profit from a land so if they can squeeze in 80 apartments in that land they will squeeze in 80 apartments and architects will say don't do that give that break one mental break you need so i uh, my partners a uh, boss ex boss they are an architects in kerala they started their own development company just for this they have done beautiful like villa um, townships and apartment buildings where their profit will be minimal they will have a profit otherwise they can't survive but they will make sure quality of life is what they were designing for and builders are only designing for profit There is a different way. You, if you can convince a builder, you'll make him a better person. Are there any like that in Chennai? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Vishranti is not bad at all. Vishranti. Yeah, yeah. They go to good architects and they listen to their architects. That the, they are the ones who designed our building. So that whole balcony there, you That's end. Yeah, second second seaver. You see that garden in front. They've done something. They've uh, sacrificed for the sake of. light and good space and all that just have one last question uh, you said that <coughs> when you reach out to your client right just so you said that you would push them you tell them you right. know, like when you have a school they say i want the maximum number of classrooms Correct. you tell them try to reduce the number of classrooms and give space right so if you if you are put in a situation where the client just does not want to agree to you whatsoever and he says no i want only those 20 classrooms would you and you are like super fed up with that because what you think is you you give them 10 classrooms and give space otherwise you are not satisfied you are like i've done just half work for money so would you rather drop the client would you just say that leave this client i'm going to move out i don't care or would you just do what they say for money great question <laughs> just last week i was in hyderabad and my partner was sitting like this because she wanted to do something and the client wanted something else so i took a board I put it down and I said, list one, list two, list three. List one is our passionate projects where the client will come on board. List three are the worst. So I'm like, fifty percent brain. We need the money. Fifty <laughs> percent brain. You can't drop it. <laughs> you can try, and you can talk to them like this. There are you won't. You'll be surprised how many people, if you go to them with a story, will think. If you give them PowerPoint slides with bullet points, it may not get as much as if you tell them a story. You know, like that Georgia Tech. You know what happened? Students' lives changed. Till, you know, it might it might happen. Suppose you are giving them limited space, and the client wants the maximum profit, and the number exceeds, and there's some conflict. Then how would you make him get satisfied, or how would you manage that space? Design. So I say that again. There's more space. There's less space, but he wants more profit. Like the number exceeds or something. How do you cut it down, or how do you manage the space? Uh, with similar thing, right? Where they want more, and I don't want to give them that much. So I will give them strategies. You want that much? I am here. Can we meet in the middle somewhere? Okay. At the end of the day, it's the client's money, right? we have to convince them that they'll be a happier person making more people happy have a larger impact on other people rather than just earning your own money everybody will fall for that everybody wants a larger impact i mean once they taste the um joy of impacting lives right nobody can go back to saying i don't want all that i just want my money i think i think i've seen that so i don't know We're on the hour to wrap it up. Thank you so much for your time. Thank This you. This is a small gift. Hey, from I got a gift. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Um,
the biggest takeaway from her session today, uh, you know, most of you don't want to be architects. There's two of you pursuing the architecture, architecture, or will probably pursue architecture, right? Is 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 that the, the multi-sensory design is not something limited only to architecture, right? I see that applying to my profession, what uh, you know, I do. Uh, Guru spoke about how the bullet trains in Japan are designed from the lessons they've learned from nature, right? Um, you know, uh, NS and uh, NS and Sunil were talking about how coding. There's a lot of lessons you learn from somewhere else. Right? There is one takeaway that you probably take away from Padma session is that life is not unidirectional. There are multiple things that you need to do. She wouldn't be what she is if she hadn't done all the things that she did, right? Music or even walking her dog uh, in the mornings. She probably gets design inspirations when they walk in the morning. Absolutely. So. What we do at Beyond Aid is just to ask you to open yourselves, to ask much as you can, uh, gather all the information, and then pursue a career rather than rather than saying at nine grade I know what I want to be. Uh, you know, let these things evolve. That's our request to all of you. All right. Uh, the last point she mentioned is that even if you are an architect, you need to be a storyteller. If you cannot tell a story, you cannot really win wherever you are. It applies to a finance professional, to a marketing professional, or to a tech professional. Right. Most tech professionals suffer from not being able to tell a story. And what happens, they, they do a small portion of the piece, and there's a shark sitting on top of them who can tell a better story, and he, he gets away with you know uh, the benefits of it. Right? So in that context, we're running a workshop on storytelling two weeks from now. Uh, it's been done by a theater professional. You'll find more details uh, on our website. It's going to be done at, uh, at, at a thing called Dam Festival. What are the dates like? Uh, this is Feb 29th. Feb 29th? Saturday. Saturday, 25th, 29th. Dakshin Chitra. At Dakshin Chitra. So, irrespective of which profession you are in, storytelling is the future. Right? You can be a marketer, you can be a finance professional, you can be an engineer, you can be a mechanic, or anything you want. Storytelling is very, very important. I would request you to spread the word and tell them that storytelling is a very, very important art. And who better than a theater artist, right? Movie is all about storytelling, right? The only reason we go sit there for three hours until the beautiful story is told to us, right? So you can learn the art of storytelling from a theater personality, and he works a lot with students. So the date to be blocked is uh, Feb 29th in uh, in uh, Chitra. We are also running a lot of other workshops. Look up our website. There's one coming on publishing uh, next week. Uh, there are very very sessions coming for it. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, there's a new uh, formality or a new uh, routine. I want to start in sessions. We'll take a selfie. We have not go <laughs> to the end of it. We'll take a selfie with the, the speaker so all of you can probably join behind her and make a small yeah. space. <laughs> Instead of you all sitting there and I'm here. Yeah, you take the picture. Oh, I have to take it. I just want to add thank you all for sharing your stories, not just listening, coming out with yours. It was slow, but you all came nicely in the end. It takes that time to assimilate and yeah. think and formulate thoughts, I guess. A uh, big thank you to Mr. Kumar Rainbow. He's given us his space. He's also been a big supporter of Beyond Day. So, big round of applause to him. Thank you so much. Is there any coffee, tea for anyone? Ask somebody to